Good afternoon and welcome to the Calnex Solutions PLC Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time by the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Just simply type in your questions and press send. <coughs> the company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives in the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to CEO Tommy Cook. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, and thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today to hear about the results from H1 FY24. So before we go into the results, let me just take a few minutes to, for the people that maybe don't do it, know us so well to just remind you who Calnex is and what we do. So Calnex delivers test solutions to the worldwide uh, telecoms and cloud computing industry. We already have an established position, shipping product to over 68 countries in the world. And primarily our products are used to prove performance, whether it's within the R&D or it's within networks uh, scenario, they use our products to prove that the, the, product, the, the telecom infrastructure is going to work correctly to the specification and also, also to international standards. We operate a lean business model where we use uh, an outsourced uh, indirect uh, sales channel partnership around the world to give us that global footprint. And we also use a, a, a local manufacturer, a outsourced contract manufacturer, to do a, a production for us. And you can see on the right, the right hand side some of the, the names that you'll be familiar with that we sell to telecom vendors like Cisco, Sienna, Ericsson, uh, the, the operators such as BT, AT&T. We sell to the component manufacturers, Intel, Qualcomm, uh, Broadcom, and then increasingly we sell to some of the large enterprises and the hyperscale people like Meta, Google, and Apple. So quite a wide space. So where does test fit into the world of telecoms? Well, it fits in just about everywhere. Whether you're designing new equipment, you're verifying new equipment, new designs before they go into production, in manufacturing tests, building networks, managing networks. The bits that we focus on mainly is that design validation conformance test. So you can imagine that see R&D teams in a company like a Cisco or Ericsson, when they get their prototypes back, they have to test them to see, make sure the design's meeting the, the published specification. And then the conformance test part of that is if they're gonna claim conformance to international standards, which virtually every piece of equipment will, then they need to put it through and check that it actually does meet that. And it's very much an area where you can command a healthy price and gain margin, because effectively we are enabling our customers to get their new designs to market quickly and robustly. And robustly is as important as quickly because ultimately they want to make sure they have good design margin, that once again to manufacturing tests, they don't um, have yield issues. Plus once they start getting deployed in the many networks around the world, all of which are different uh, topologies, that it's gonna work under all conditions. So that's very much an area where we focus on. The one other area we focus on is the maintenance and, mo and uh, monitoring part. So it's not so much in building new networks, that, uh, but it's more that maintenance that once they, they've figured out there is a, a complex prod, problem, then they need a tester that gives them deep insight into what's going on in the network to allow them to debug it. And that's where our testers fit in. So that's really broadly where we sit in the world. So what's been happening lately? Well, as you know, it's not the greatest of times in the telecoms world at the moment. Very much the industry has gone through a flat period Looking back, it probably started at the turn of the year. And for the last three quarters, our business from the telecom space has, has proven to be quite flat. Um, I think in general, what happens in the whole ecosystem, you have the operators at the head of the food chain who obviously are building out the mobile networks and they still need to do that. And in our judgment and everything we see in the trade press suggests that need is still there. They need to do it in future, but they've slowed down the build. A lot of these build outs are done using bonds or from our debt and obviously interest rates going up has caused that to slow down. And of course, when the operators slow down the spend, then the equipment vendors that supply the operators, they slow down and basically become more cautious about the spend, especially in capital equipment budgets and our equipment's bought from their capital equipment budget. So we are a bit of the, you know, the tail of the dog in the situation. We've seen this before within Calnex, we've seen it twice before. In my 40 years in this industry, I've seen it many times before in the telecoms industry, where when there's lack of confidence uh, in, in growth, then they basically slow down their spend. They become very cautious in capital spend budgets, which all companies do. It's the first lever you pull. 
And in fact, what I would say is the behavior we're seeing from key customers is, is the same as it's always is. They basically keep trying to delay their spend. They will spend, so it's not like that we are not getting any business, but they'll try and hold off spend to kind of manage that their expenses through these periods. So the behavior is the same as we've always seen. Um, in, in terms of street prices as well, you'll see the street price hasn't changed for our product. It's either they can get it signed off or they can't get it signed off. And leading with things like discount, etc., is not a great way because all they'll do is take the discount and still give you the order on the next period, but take the discount in the following period. So we've managed through these situations before. It's about staying close to customers, managing that customer relationship. It's a chance to build relationships with customers, try and help them. The thing that's difficult to, to forecast is how long it's going to last. And in each one of these times, it always lasts a different amount. And really, because the, in my view, the, the pressure's coming from outside the industry, interest rates, the general concerns about the wider economic situation, it's you know it's it's hard to see. And at this point, we still don't see the green shoots of, um, of recovery. And the recovery is likely to take a kind of three to four to five month period because it, they won't suddenly start spending overnight. They'll just start to release their budgets. And that's why it's important to stay close to your customers to make sure your POs top of the list are high in the pile to get uh, to get budget when budget comes available. So you've got to stick in, but it's not a matter of sitting doing nothing during this time. We're going to continue to drive, work with a, a core customer base, but also look for other opportunities that we'll talk about. So as I said, it's, you know, I guess let's look at what's happened through the first half. So for the first half of this year, our revenues were 7.8 million. A profit before tax was, a, we made a loss of 0.6 million, but we said, and we have a closing cash balance of over 13 million uh, pounds in the bank. And we're gonna continue to supply a dividend of 0.31p per share. And that's the same level that we supply, that we uh, awarded last year for the first half of FY23. The revenue drop is really down to the, the subdued level of orders. Our funnel is quite healthy, but it's that last part of getting it closed that's a challenge. And obviously, we should know, we, we announced a downgrade in October, and that was really because we didn't see the uptake. Most of it, typically in our quarter, the, the third month of the quarter is always a stronger order month. And in these situations, it's, it, it becomes even stronger that way where Basically, our customers are waiting to hear whether they're allowed to spend and the customers are waiting to see what happens through the quarter before they decide in, in, uh, towards the end of the quarter. So September really didn't uptick in the way that we hoped it did. And that meant we had to look at what was happening and kind of be realistic in terms of what we expected in the near term. But we believe we're in a strong position in the market. We still have a strong order funnel. You know, orders that are well qualified don't disappear. Again, that's typical to what we've seen in these markets. That they, they may, what becomes hard is to predict when it's actually going to turn into an order. But we don't get cancelled orders and, and even deals, as I said, that are well qualified tend to stay. They don't go away. They just, it's, it's that unpredictability at the end. But of course, our business in the non-telecom space is starting to grow. And that's an area that we're going to focus on while keeping contact with the telecoms and waiting for it to come back again. We'll focus on the non-telecom space to, 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 to address new applications and places where we can generate growth. So we're going to maintain our, our investment in R&D and customer relationships. You know, in terms of, and we'll talk some more about the new product program, we have an extensive product program. And that's essential to get growth back coming out with new equipment, whether or new enhancements to our equipment, whether it's to better address some application areas where we can close business, or whether it's to meet the ever-changing standards that we have. Because again, when you have new equipment, again, from experience, it's, we find it's, it's easier to get the deals over the line when it's something new rather than selling a second or a third unit to a customer. So that's really important. That's why we believe we can get growth back in the business and we're keeping our investment in R&D. And of course, in customer relationships, ships the investment in that in terms of travel budgets although they're tightly managed it's a time period where you want to engage more with customers not less you don't want to retreat to the fort you got out there and speak to people work with them try and help them get that relationship strong so that when money becomes available and um, you you, you, pay, you get the benefit at that time and we have already some new uh, capability released there's a new product type called the sne x and sne ignite it's a a common platform that has two variants um, and we've already released SNE X and Ignite will ship in Q4 which is January February time 
and we've already secured the first orders for that equipment. And our NE1 platform that we, we acquired last year when we acquired iTrinity, that's gaining traction and been moved more into places like government and defence spend, again, areas where it's not been so affected as the telecom space. So there are things happening and things that we're going to continue to follow through to ensure that we can not just sit around waiting for the world coming back to us, but we look to, to generate growth from the things that we are doing on the ground. As I said, we are closing business and I've just come up with kind of six case studies here to try and give you a flavour of what, where are you getting business, I'm sure you're asking. The telecoms world is still given, you know, we're still getting business from the telecoms. It's just a bit harder than it has been in the last couple of years. On the left hand side of the slide, the top left there, we're actually one of our tier one European operators who we've sold to for many years have actually just bought some Paragons because the need was such that they, they decided they need to spend and invest. So there's still business coming from our top customers. We also had success from one of the US uh, big network operators where we again we've sold for many years, but we've actually just sold one of our new SNEX products. Again, we were able to persuade them the capability and, and the value that delivers to them was worth a while to, to invest in it at this time. But then there's some new uh, cases where we're getting new business as well that we've tried to show on the right hand side. In the middle at the top, India data center operator has just acquired one of our products. And this is for what they call a hyper-converged infrastructure, a grand term. But what it really means is they're basically hosting a network, a mobile uh, network infrastructure in the data center. So that's basically the storage capability, the switching capability um, that's required. And that, that's been successful. And like in all these cases, our standard processes, when this happens, we get a new customer, we really understand why the customer tried to why the customer has bought it where the value was so that we can then create sales collateral and take it to other similar operators data center operators and see whether we can turn that one success into multiple successes we've also been successful with an education research center in europe they've actually set up a proof of concept lab where they're actually inviting companies to come in and look at and come up with ideas on future 5g and obviously 6g infrastructure what it's going to do these don't often generate a lot of a direct follow on business, uh, but what it does is it actually allows us to meet other customers and other cust potential customers and, and people to see our equipment in action and cause customer relationships. So we would hope that would lead to um, us getting new customers in the future, why people coming to these labs, bringing their equipment, but seeing our equipment in action and become interested in inquiring one for their own lab. As I mentioned earlier, the defense and government sector is an area where spending is continuing and is not so affected by the kind of global challenges that are happening. Uh, um, center uh, bottom there, we actually sold to a US defense contract. And as you know, if you've ever sold to the defense sector, it's pretty hard to understand exactly what they're doing because they don't like telling you very much. Um, but it looked like they were using any one, which is a network emulator to basically for training for their op operators of remote stuff, whether it's, I guess, people on the ground, equipment on the ground, things in the air. And basically they were setting up uh, realistic world situations where all the devices are at different positions in the battlefield. They're actually, you know, different con uh, bandwidths, different sort of network connections to them and using their equipment to emulate that situation to allow them to train their people to be effective in the real situations. And the last one I brought up here is a, an IT system integrator that fo in the US that focuses on government uh, contracts. Now I've kind of labeled that new customer slash channel because although it's a new customer in that we would sell it direct to them, effectively it's like a channel because they basically take contracts from, from the US government uh, and whether it's for full systems, IT systems, cyber security, the whole thing, put things together, do the installation. So very much system integrator but they've agreed and, and see the value of including the any one in bundles that they sell to their customers. So that's another case where we're continuing to look for new areas where we can expand our, our footprint and gain further business. So at that point, I'm gonna hand over to Ashley and she's gonna give you some more details on the financials. Thanks, Tommy. Just before I go on to the detail on the next slide on the income statement, I thought it would be useful just to give you a quick recap of our revenue model. So as some of you will know, Calnex generates revenues through the sale of bundled hardware and software, as well as software support and extended warranty programs. So a typical customer 
will purchase one of our hardware products with a number of software options included at that time. And then that is invoiced as one bundled sale. And then that customer, same customer, can come back for upgrades or additional options that are added to that existing hardware that they've purchased in the past through the provision of a license key. And we can also sell those software sales or upgrades um, as, as standalone sales. So bundled hardware and software is our main uh, our main revenue stream. And as you might expect, the pricing will differ for each order because it really just depends on that combination of what the customer has purchased in terms of hardware and software option choices, depending on what, what they what they need at that time. Then that revenue is recognized on dispatch or delivery of the software license key if it's just a standalone software um, upgrade deal. And then each of our products comes with a standard warranty period, which can be extended for an extra fee. And we also sell software support programs, and that makes up the, uh, the a smaller portion of our revenue streams. That uh, stream, sorry, the revenue that revenue is recognised over the life of the product. So just onto the income statement, as Tommy's revenue for the half was 7.8 million, which is a 38% decline on last year's half, and that's driven by as Tommy was. Also seeing the dynamics in the in telecoms market and consequently our lower level of orders generated from the same market. Our indirect cost base is largely fixed, so the performance in revenue is dropped through to the bottom line profit, as you can see here. I've got more information on the regional and product line revenue trends on in the half on the next slide. So I'll I'll um I'll go through the rest of the income statement and come back to revenue just to give you a, a bit of extra detail on the revenue trends in just a minute. So just working down the income statement here, you can see gross margin was 74% in the half year, and that's largely in line with the full year margin in the prior year and prior year um, half uh, prior half trends as well. So just as a reminder, that gross margin is net of commissions to payable to our channel partners. So that's the gross margin that belongs to us. Gross margins can fluctuate one to two percentage points through the year, and that really just depends on the mix of the products and the mix of that bundle of hardware and software that I was talking about before, particularly in a shorter period. We increased our pricing through discussion with our distributors in the early part of last year, and that's helped us maintain gross margins while, while we have seen some of the direct material cost increases come through from the wider economic challenges that the world is having. So we're keeping a very tight hold on costs while we go through this period of reduced order volumes. As a result, um, we haven't had any um, headcount increases apart from graduate hires in the period. So we have a graduate hire hiring program that we have continued because it's on a cyclical basis. Um, so the only increase in heads has been five graduate hires in the period, no other headcount uh, increases across the company. And as you, as you can see here, admin costs, so admin costs in this particular table excludes depreciation and other um, um, or in, uh, other an amortization, sorry, which are shown separately here. That came in just under the prior year level, as you can see, as a result of lower commissions on the lower order volumes, um, lower hiring costs because of our, um, our um, pause on adding heads and reduced profit share accruals offset partially by increases to share based payment accruals. We also had a small amount of acquisition costs included in the prior year P&L for the Itronigy acquisition, which were non-recurring, so we had to save in there as well. And as you'll know, we capitalise 100% of our R&D costs and amortise these to the P&L over five years. Our R&D amortisation came in at 1.8 million for the period as planned versus 1.6 million in the prior year. And that increase is solely due to the, the pattern of R&D cash spend in the previous five years as that five year amortization profile comes through. So the loss, as Tommy was saying, loss before tax came in at 0.6 million. And that's very much driven by the revenue performance from a, a volume perspective. Our fixed cost base creates a negative operational gearing effect on the P&L at this time as we retain our retain our headcount and retain our cost base in order to return to growth in future periods. The full year market guidance from our brokers shows a break even position. And so that assumes a he slightly heavier weighting to H2 for revenues, but that, that, heavier, that heavier weighting in revenue volumes 
will drop through to profit to, uh, to, to bring the profit back to a break-even level. Costs should continue on H1 run rates. So just um, just a, um, a quick one on the um, tax rate here, just to explain it. Look, looking at the tax number and the tax effective rate, looking at it mathematically, the effective tax rate comes in at 37%. However, that's quite an unusual rate and it's very much driven by, by the mathematics um, and on the loss making position. So I just wanted to pull out a couple of things here to explain it because it's not something that we would in, envisage being our effective tax rate going forward. Um, as we return to, to profit and as we return to growth, we would expect our effective tax rate to go back in line with previous years, which sits around about that sort of mid-20%. Mid so just a couple of things to explain that. The underlying applicable rate applied to the loss-making profit before tax was 25% cent, which is the usual UK corporation um, tax rate. And as you'll know, we benefit from R&D tax credits and in the period, um, we benefited from the SME scheme in the, in the half year, the, the, um, the RDEX scheme, which is the, the larger scheme um, we also benefit from, but that comes in, in, the, in H2 as an, an accounting journal. The SME scheme credits are accounted for within the tax line, and the tax credits are calculated as a percentage of the R&D spend in the year and not on the, on the profit. So that, that tax credit has had the effect of increasing the overall um, the tax tax in the period, the tax credit in the period and flipped it into a credit position. So that's what's driving the 37% there. EPS is currently at a loss uh, plus per share of 0.42 pence, and that's driven very much by the trading performance. So just on to the next slide, um, just to take you through some of the revenue movements in the period. So as you can see from the disclosure notes in the RNS, the wider economic climate and the subdued market had an impact on revenue levels across our geographies. And it, it has also had an effect across our product lines as well. So I just want to give you a little bit more information on that. So as you'll know, we've got our three regions, which are Americas, North Asia and rest of the world. And then that rest of the world region is broken down into Europe, Middle East, India, Southeast Asia, and Australasia. And in that rest of the world region, tr trading was least affected by the slowdown, with the EMEA sub-region -re performing strongest in that region. And that's where our business has come from a wider range of sectors, including automotive, power, and rail, alongside telecoms at the same time. Within North Asia, we're increasing our focus on growing the business in Taiwan and Japan, while China remains challenging due to the impact of US restrictions. And the Americas region saw most of the impact from the slowdown in the telecoms market, as you might expect. We're continuing to stay close, very close to our end customers in, um, in this region and the other two, while increasing our focus on opportunities within hyperscalers and government end markets, where we see the best chance to close business. And from a product line perspective, Lab, Lab Sync, and that, so that's the Paragon products, and you'll see that on a, a slide coming up in, in Tommy's next section, that saw performance come in lower than the previous period, which is <clears throat> driven very much by that product line's end market being largely telecoms. And that's also the case with Sentinel, which sits in our Network Sync product line. Our plans for our um, growing our Sentry sales, which is our newer Network Sync product, aimed at use in the data centers are continuing. And from a cloud and IT perspective, we need to look at it from both the infrastructure and applications perspective as the drivers are just slightly different. So in, within infrastructure, the SME has, that, has had a larger exposure to the US market. So saw performance drop as a result of the wider economic challenges. But this is expected to pick up in H2 as a result of the launch of our SME X and SME Ignite products, which Tom will touch on later in the presentation. And in applications, which is our new our any one product from the Trinity acquisition last year, we're on track to achieve our original full year revenue target as our channel expansion plans continue, together with success from selling into defence and satellite communication sectors. So on to the cash flow. So as you can see here, total cash outflow for the period was 5.6 million, which reflects both the loss in the period and increases in working capital, which is namely inventory. And, and the, the increases in working capital are, are largely one-off in nature in the period. So I just wanted to pull out a few things there to explain that. 
So working capital movements were 3.3 million and the large majority of that was inventory. So that, that was um, driven by three things. So we always planned to build up a little bit more of our on on the shelf of the inventory, inventory that we can have access to within our own building as opposed to our outsourced manufacturer. And um, so we, we always had that plan to use that as a buffer stock to mitigate against any future supply chain delays that, that we suffered from in previous years. We also um, are the demand plans that we have in place with our outsourced manufacturer uh, were based on previous order expectations, which always take um, a little bit longer time to dial down compared to compared to the the, the market, um, the end market forecast changes that happen out in the in the wider world from a customer perspective. So it just takes time to dial down through the supply chain as the supply chain is longer than just our outsourced manufacturer, as you might expect. And inventory, inventory purchases made as a result of the tail end of the supply chain issues were also coming through as well. So a lot of these were one-off in nature. And excluding any further tail end effects of the supply chain issues, we don't expect working capital movements in H2 to mirror those of H1. And we don't expect them to be as material. We paid 0.8 million in tax to HMRC this period, but that was based on profits generated in the prior year. And given the current expectations for trading for FY24, this cash should be refundable in FY25 after submission of the FY24 year end tax return. Cash spent on R&D activities, which is capitalized and amortized over five years, was 2.6 million versus 2.5 million last half year. And that slight increase just reflects the inflationary salary increases and, and the graduate headcount increases that I was talking about earlier. And as I, as I said earlier, there were no other headcount increases in R&D in this period. We still hold surplus cash in notice accounts to, to gain a little bit more of a higher interest when we can. Um, but we don't hold any on any long term deposit over 95 days. So that just explains that 1.5 million cash inflow coming in there in, in the one off item section, which just explains the statutory layout of the cash flow. We still have no debt on the balance sheet. And as a result of the, the, the working capital flows normalizing in H2 weeks and, and the, the profit coming back to break even, we expect H2 cash to be break even um, and to, in order for us to maintain that cash balance um, to the end of the year. So to summarize, while the results for the period are disappointing, we're seeing encouraging performance from our new products, and Tommy will touch on that a little bit um, more on, in his next section. Our gross margins have remained robust and in line with previous years, and we're keeping tight control of our existing cost base to minimize any additional impact to profit. Our ever productive R&D and, and sales teams are focusing on areas that will generate future growth for the business, whether that be in telecoms or non-telecoms end markets. And our investment in inventory means we can be ready to reduce order fulfillment lead times and control order fulfillment lead times once demand picks up. And we have a healthy cash balance, which we expect to maintain over H2, providing us with a good foundation on which to return to stronger financial performance in future periods. I'll hand you back over to Tommy. Okay, thank you, Ashley. So just to finish off here, let's just have a quick uh, recap of our strategy and also just wanted to look at our product program to try and give you some insight to why it's important and how it's it's going to deliver growth for us moving forward. So our strategy is the same as it's been for a number of years, not surprisingly. We're going to continue to focus our product innovation and capitalise on the growth of 5G or the build out of the mobile network. Um, you know, I think everything we, we watch very carefully, the trade press and and, and then you know, back in 2001, there was a structural problem in our industry and we suffer badly from it. I do not believe that's what's happening here, that it's a wider economic climate. You, there's definitely a slowdown at the moment, but the drivers, the underlying need of the world to get a, a more effective communications network just seems to be still there. So we firmly believe that it will come back because it needs to come back. So it's a, it continues to be a key focus for us. And of course, the cloud computing area is the other area that we focus on whether it's actually the infrastructure that creates these data centers or whether it's the applications uh, and software that's running in, in the cloud. Both of these things, again, the world's still kind of moving towards that way. Things like AI here talked about, 
causes some concerns in that world because of the processing required to 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 deliver an AI request. For example, if you ask, you know, your your browser for you show me John Lucy's homepage. Imagine the, the processing that was required to do that versus say, could you give me the history of John Lucy's? So it's you know the whole AI is going to put a huge amount of uh, pressure on the cloud computing or the, the data centers, and they need to look at efficiencies as well as how to build it out. And a lot of what we are doing with them is making their infrastructure more efficient. So we still believe there's a lot of opportunities going to come out of that. So these two growth engines, we still believe, uh, are core growth engines for in our industries, or for our markets, uh, and, and will continue to be for the foreseeable. And the third thing that we've always talked about is that we are open to m &E opportunities. We are continuing to look for these. As you know, in our market, there isn't a huge number of testing and measurement companies. There are a few as in tens of them but there's not hundreds of thousands so there's always an element of, of opportunism of when something comes along at the right time so we are continuing to look we're continuing to speak to people uh, and if something comes to the point that we think it's the right product to expand our portfolio to create what i would call new business that's either selling to people we don't sell to today or selling something in addition to our current customers then it's a it's a case i would take to the board for discussion to see whether this is something that we should move on our product program, you'll have hopefully seen this slide before, is a, we basically focus on developing platforms that we can add lots of capability to. Um, we have a number of new things. I've already mentioned the SNE. You can see on the, the right-hand side, there's now three SNE platforms, SNE, SNEX, and SNE Ignite. And the reason for that is the top two are really based on a new platform that's tightly linked to the SNE. So there's a, a lot of commonality, but by using different platforms, which actually have different build price points. It also allows us to position it to the, the many different groups and the applications that need a network emulator. So we can focus the right platform, whether it's high performance and Ignite from a hardware-based implementation, or it's high complexity at the low data rates in the SNE, or in the middle there where you're working on the high data rates, <coughs> high complexity, then we can target the right, the right product to the right customer, and obviously value price it in that in, in, in that market, but still gain a healthy margin from that. And on the, in, in the center block, we have the SyncSense. This is a new product that we introduced earlier in the last comms meeting. Um, and we're just still in the very early stages of discussing this with customers. So this is a monitoring system where we put probes across a whole network, whether it's within a data center or whether it's within a telecoms network, that looks at the synchronization and reports where there might be issues. So we're at a very early stage in, with this and we have started to engage with seed customers or what we would call development partners to help us tune the, the offering and make sure that we're offering something that's real value. So early to say when, you know, where that's gonna take us, we are quite excited about it. Unlikely to get much business or any business FY24, but we'd be looking to hopefully close the first orders for that in FY25. But in all these platforms, we've actually got ongoing development. And in this slide, I've tried to kind of summarize that and give you a flavor of why do you have this. So in this strange picture on the right-hand side, there's three columns. The left-hand column is the, the various platforms that we were just looking at in the previous slide. The middle column is the various projects. And then the right-hand side, I've tried to indicate who that's aimed at, whether it's telecoms or non-telecoms. And you can see in all our platforms, we're continually enhancing it. And that's very much the nature of what we do. Our customers invest in our platform, and it's not just the investment in terms of buying the product, but they, they train their, their people to use them, but they often develop software routines to run automated test scripts to test their equipment. So they want our products to continue to keep up the standards, fall on technology waves. So some of these are fairly big projects, like at the bottom there, We've got the SNE Ignite and X that I've talked about. That's a, a project that's been going over 15 months and it's just coming to the end. So it's a major platform change that's coming along. And like most of our products and most of the technology, it's the same technology underneath, even though different sectors are using it. So kind of 80%, 85% of the, the functionality that we have to develop is common to all applications, but we add a layer on the top that sometimes there's special features that are particular application needs or you want to present it in a way that makes the, that the specific customers understand how they can use it in their application. So that's why the same product can end up target both telecoms and non-telecoms. 
We have other big projects, the one at the very top, 800 gigs, that's adding the, the current leading edge functionality to the Paragon Neo, something our customers are already asking us for. And we've started developing it because we had to wait until the, the building, this is really leading edge technology and the building blocks only became available about two quarters ago to us that we could actually start and make a project and, and build that. That'll come out the second half of FY25. So again, it's that kind of longer term. But in between, we need to keep up with the standards. We need to keep giving new functionality. So things like Release 11, which is a bit of a vanilla name, but it's got a whole host of smaller features that the customers are asking for to make sure we keep up with the standards, keep up with their needs as we go along. So. These are also very important because when you have something new, it allows a sales team to get in front of customers again, saying, hey, we've got some new capability, can I come in and explain it to you? And allow them to go in there and start engaging. So our programs always need this. We continually need to enhance our products because our customers' needs are, are changing. But of course, that means we can obviously generate revenue from these enhancements as well. So as you can see, we've got a full program of continuous enhancements. And these are what gives us confidence that in the future, in FY25, we can start to, to generate growth, even if the telecoms market stays flat on us, because we feel that we're, we are starting to come out with new products that will generate business and target new applications. So to summarize that, all that together, we still believe the underlying market drivers of the build out of the mobile network and move to cloud computing have not changed. There is a clearly a, a near term, you know, a softness in the market due to the macroeconomic effects that are happening around the world, but the drivers are still there. New product program is really important, and that's why we've continued to invest in our new products, because that is important to keep engaged with customers, see that our customers that have invested in our programs, that we are going to follow through with them, but also develop new unmet needs and, and basically, you know, and hopefully encourage people to place orders for the new capability. We have a team, as, you know, I keep mentioning I've been around for quite a long while in this market, but we're actually a very experienced team. So we have been through these downturns before. Nobody wants them, but we do not work in a straight line technology uh, market. We do not keep telecoms is never always kept going up. It wobbles as we go along and you just need to deal with the situation. And we've got a team that's been through this before and know how to do it, how to stay and keep these customer relationships strong, how to keep working with our partners and be in a strong position, go and make you know business where we can, but also stay strong so that when the market comes back, we can start to grow in these markets as well. Our pricing has remained stable. We haven't really seen the street price drop. The problem is just getting the whole order over the line. It's not a matter of street price. As Ashley mentioned, we have a robust balance sheet. We have cash in the bank. We are at the, at the moment running more on a kind of break even from this point on. So we are in a strong position, but we do believe that we can get growth back into the business, both some in the second half from the kind of seasonality and some of the new the early introduction of programs. But obviously as we go into FY25, even if the market stays flat on us, we will be able to bring growth back into our business and make and have a stronger FY25 than FY24. So at that point, that's the end of the formal presentation. Perfect, Tommy. Ashley, thank you very much for your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions just by using the Q&A tab, which is situated on the top right-hand corner of your screen. But just while the company take a few moments to read those questions submitted today, I'd like to remind you that the recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your investor dashboard. Tommy, Ashley, as you can see, we've received pre-submitted questions today. We've also received a number of questions throughout today's live event. And if I could just ask you to read out those questions and give responses where it's appropriate to do so, I'll pick up from you both at the end. Okay, thanks, Alexandra. Okay, let me, so there was three pre-submitted questions, so I think it's only right we answer these first. I'll take the first two and then hand over to Ashley to do the third one. So the first one was both Ericsson and Nokia have recently released pretty poor numbers and short-term forecasts for continued weakness in their networking businesses. Do you feel your, feel your financial balance and business structure is sufficiently robust to withstand another year or two of weak demand? What do you need to do? In some ways, I think I've just, well, I hope I've answered that question. You know, I think um, we are in a, I think we have a robust balance sheet. We are in a, we have cash in the bank. Uh, we are in a situation where we believe from this point on we can run at break even and above, but break even is not where anybody wants to be. We want to be above. And through a new product program, by going looking for opportunities, we can grow. As I say, at times when you're the tail of the dog, you have to wait for the dog to waggle. 
like of you, but we are not going to sit back and wait for that. We're going to go out there looking for business. It's a good time to for, to encourage our teams and, and drive our teams to go and look for new areas where we can we can we can find new applications which will spread our portfolio, spread our footprint, which will be strong for us in the future. So yes, we do believe we're in a position that we can manage uh, this period for if it goes on for a more extended period. But fingers crossed, that's not the case. Is Calnix and its advisors aware that it's customary to release market sensitive information at 7 a.m.? All other market sensitive announcements by Calnix have been released at 7 a.m. Why was the trading update on the 10th of October released at 3.17 p.m.? Good question. Well, you know, I think the reality is that just to kind of clarify from a com compliance point of view, we are required to release it as soon as it is available, i.e. the board has completed their work to complete the RNS in terms of they've made a decision we have to then obviously get a document and make sure that we spend time to get the wording right, especially in this one that was coming out, or the one that came out on the 10th of October. It was important to get all the wording correct and get a clear message and a succinct message out to you. And actually, and by compliance, when it's ready, to, it's supposed to be released at that time. And if it's before 4.30 in the day, then that's what happens. We probably had assumed, we thought we could get it out early in the day, but just getting that wording right, it kind of drifted further into the day. And that's why it came out in the middle of the afternoon. But we believe we were following our, our requirements by the market to release the information to you as soon as we, we, were, we were aware of that and we could communicate it clearly to you. Ashley, do you want to take the third question? Sure, um, no problem. And then it's actually the third pre-submitted question is actually related to another couple of questions that, um, that have come in during the call. So I'll just read them all out because hopefully we'll be able to answer them all in one answer. So pre-submitted question, why are you confident that your only supplier, Kelvin side, will survive any major economic downturn? And that's also a similar question to um, a question that Andrew J has asked. How has your slowdown affected your outsourced manufacturer? Any issues with their stability? And Freddie A has also asked a question. We are reliant upon a third party for manufacturer. How are they dealing with the industry slowdown? Are they robust? So I'll just answer all of them in one block, if that's okay. So Kelvin side, um, Kelvin side manufacturer for us, but they also have quite a diversified portfolio of of customers that that aren't that don't face into the telco um, uh, end markets. So we we usually sit at the top um, in in amongst the top three customers for for Kelvin side the other two main customers that they have are non non uh, telco based companies they they deal more in um, aerospace government defense type industries and those customers for for Kelvin side actually took a dip in covid and are actually growing from the covid times have they've seen quite a lot of growth from those customers um, um into into this period so the diversified portfolio that they have helps to spread the risk in times when one customer um, is ha, has dipped in demand, they, they have seen uh, an increased demand in their other customers. We also have a really close relationship with Kelvin side. So we share information um, with them when, when we can share information with them on, on our public information, we do, but we also receive um, financial information from them on a regular basis just because um, of that close relationship that we have with them so the communication channels are very open um, from a from a, an operational perspective but also from a financial information perspective so we do have very um, regular conversations with them on their um, on their financials on their cash flow on their on their overall stability um, they they are um, they are actually in, a, in in growth at the moment just uh, because of that growth that's coming back from their other customers. So um, at this moment in time, we don't see any any risks with their financial stability. They're also not not leveraged as well, um, so they have no no significant bank bank debt, so they're not suffering any interest costs that the other manufacturers may may be suffering. And then there was another question here. Uh, hopefully that answers the Kelvin side question um, or questions. There's another uh, question here um, from Simon B. Um, so it says, FD mentioned that the slight reduction in admin expenses was partly due to less sales commissions being paid. I'm not an accountant, but should sales commissions be part of sales costs? So actually all our sales costs 
So the cost of the sales team and their salary, their sort of non-commission based salary costs, their travel costs, etc., all sit within admin costs. So their sales commission, the sales commission costs are linked directly back to that, to, to where they're accounted for within administration costs. So that's essentially where should that that should sit. So um so from a like for like perspective, they, they both sit in the same the same um pot when it comes to the statutory layout of the peanut. Okay. okay, I've got a couple of questions here, Ashley, I'll pick up. Uh, Andrew asked a question, you mentioned kept having to work in various topologies. So to what extent could you be liable if your equipment validates a piece of kit which subsequently doesn't perform as anticipated in a specific application? Yeah, I, I guess that's never came up as an issue in, 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 in my experience, Andrew. I, we tend to specify or prove particular situations and what usually is the problem and actually the next questions may be linked to this in some ways I'll come to from Derek, but um, is that they haven't tested enough different scenarios. So it's not so much that we test scenarios, it's up to the customer to take our instrument and create various scenarios. We can give them ideas, we can help them think about things, but it's up to them to create the test plan at the end of the day that they do. So our product will execute that test plan for them. If they haven't got an extensive test or an extensive enough test plan, then basically they may they may run you know leave themselves to particular problems and I'll just jump to the second question because Derek's pointed one out of this sort of thing. So Derek says Optus Australia has had a complete breakdown in its service in Australia recently, which has proved very expensive. They say that it's due to an issue between its parent uh, Singtel Singtel in doing an upgrade. Are they clients and might you have helped them avoid this crisis? Uh, they, we have sold to Optus in the past. I'm not sure whether I've quite, I don't know the exact details. I'm not sure whether they've released the exact details. And I don't like, need, I don't want to sound like an ambulance chaser, but actually these things help to remind our customer base why it's important to actually test and do that sort of robust testing. Because if you do a superficial testing, you may think it looks okay, but it's not until it's into these environments. And that's where we try and provide expert advice to our customers of saying, well, you need, have you tested these things? What about this sort of scenario? And help them develop an extensive test suite so that they have completely understood what can happen in real world networks and then really replicated them in the test lab but to see what their equipment does and whether it manages it. Because there is many different things that happen in real networks and it's about creating each type of event, but sometimes combinations so we know packets get delayed, they get lost, sometimes they get misordered in networks and they come in different ways, but then you may get delay varying at the same time. So creating combinations of delay variation at the same time there's low throughput may create quite a different environment to the software than just doing each one one at a time. So it gives us a chance to basically engage with customers, try and help them. And quite, of course, the bigger their, their test plan, then more likely is they'll need more test equipment from us. So it's something that we do do. Ashley, have you got other ones you can sure. pick up? So we've got one here that um, might might uh, be quite good for us both to, to comment on. So Melville D has asked, given that Calnex is an excellent example of a very high tech UK company serving global market, how do you ensure that truly influential business supporting politicians in both Scottish and UK governments are kept very much aware of you? So um, I might just let Tommy just talk about some of the history of Calnex because the, the Scottish enterprise, um, the Scottish um, part of the Scottish government has been was, was very supportive of us um, prior to IPO, and they still remain uh, quite a significant shareholder. If you were to, if you keep, if there's a, if you look at the significant shareholders on our website, you can see Scottish enterprise sitting there in the in the top five um they they were um they were supportive right from day one um uh, from us and um for us going forward it's just about keeping keeping that sort of conversation going so that people understand how how that investment from scottish enterprise has been um, a success and um, i don't know tommy if you wanted to talk a little bit about the history of yeah, in the early days, we re received a lot of support from Scottish Enterprise. There's a long story, I'll maybe tell you one day, of how without Scottish Enterprise, Calnex would never have existed. It was a chance meeting that actually in inspired me to start the company. And in the early days, they were a huge support to us in terms of not just um, uh, grants that we, we were never shy to take a grant from them, 
but um, in terms of just for, um, mentoring and support in all sorts of ways. So they've always been very supportive of us. Today we get probably less support because we do, you know, we're a bigger company. We don't need support. We've got cash in the bank. So it's, I'm not sure it's right that we would be taking a lot of support. I think, but in, over the years, the SE have been very influential, have been very supportive to us. Even remember back when the banking crisis hit, that was one of the bad times for the company. We were a very young company. We were closing one or two deals a month and I had three, three months when there was no deals. So as you can imagine, it was a bit nippy to say the least. But SE was straight in and managed to get us a grant for travel to go out. As I said, go see customers, don't sit there and do nothing, get out there. So they've always been very supportive and, and, and in many ways, Carnex wouldn't have existed if it wasn't for Scottish Enterprise. Got another one here that I can take. If okay. I can. Yeah. Um. So Stephen R has asked two questions. I can just cover both of them. Um. Hopefully. So, um. Two quick ones. He says, "Am I right in thinking Spirant is an important distributor for you? Would that be more than ten percent of revenues?" And the second question is, "Did you give us the approximate split between telco businesses and other?" So, from a Spirant perspective, we so um very much so from a distributor perspective, it's actually um closer to. 65 to 70 percent of our um our orders go through go through spirant we still maintain that conversation with the the end customer so we're very much in touch with the end customer at, at, at for every for every transaction um the orders do do go through spirant for that percentage of um of volume in our orders we also have other distributors across our our network that make up the large majority of the the rest of the rest of the order flows um, we have a very small um, percentage of customers that we deal with uh, deal with directly so hopefully that answers that part of the question and then in terms of the approximate split, split between telco businesses and other we don't we don't um, show that um, in our half year uh, RNS we do on a uh, from a few year perspective um, so um, in a sort of trend from the sort of the last three years trend from a telco versus non-telecoms um orders in the year that has been averaging out at around about 23 percent in in terms of when you look at last year's last year's orders we do expect that that percentage to to continue it may be slightly higher than that in the in in the in the year just depending on their percentage compared to, to telcos but and that's essentially where we've seen the trend historically. You should be able to see that within the annual report for um, for last year, which is on our website in the financial section. You should see it within the revenue um, revenue model section. Okay, there's a question here from Lucas. I'll pick up. It's a good, good question, Lucas. Can you talk a little uh, bit more about the new customers for the military sector? Are those first deliveries just a test run for them or, or to try out the solutions? What potential do you see in the medium term and where you expect this to go? <laughs> to my, most of my life's been with telecoms and my working life's been with telecoms and we form really strong relationships and we, I'd like to believe, are a trusted partner. We can sit down with our lead people who will tell us what they're going to do next year and the year after, what they think about technologies in a very honest way, even though they know we speak to their competitors, but they completely trust us because we would never pass information between anybody, any customers. But they will tell us everything they're thinking of doing. And that's helpful because it allows us to obviously get a, a roadmap in place to have the capability there when they need it. I always get frustrated with the military people. I guess it's bred into them. They just don't tell you anything. So. I'm not sure how easy it is to answer this question, Lucas, because they really don't tell you very much um, at all what they're doing. They're very polite, but you walk away and you think, I'm not sure he really told me anything I couldn't have guessed. You know, I think from that sales that we had there um, into the work, I would assume, and it's just my assumption, that they actually do lots of training of their operators to manage all sorts of scenarios in terms of different situations, different points in the world where equipment's getting controlled from. So I would like to think they are actually building this in and they will use it not just as a, a, a kind of single run, but a, a, an ongoing, because from what we know about it, it sounds like it was getting put into an environment that would be used on an ongoing basis. I think that's why, I guess, in the, in the, in the, the test case example slide, I put up about this system integrator. Because I guess with the military, with all customers, it's how do you get to customers? How do you speak to them? You might have a product they like, but how do you get it to them? 
And I guess this is where having this system integrator who already has established relationships into the defence sector and a better route in, it feels this is important for us to actually basically work through them as a channel partner and use their contacts and, and leverage and make sure they understand how our product can be used and leverage through there. And hopefully we can get into the, these military uh, accounts in the US and, and increase our business there. Is that us a bit? Finished all this one more here. One more. Yeah, let me try and answer this last one and then I think that's what we're done. Are your telco customers mainly cutting on big investments or do you see a broader cutting in small investments, R and D OPEX? I would I guess in terms of what we are seeing, you know, at the end we are further back. These big cuts are happening at the front end of the chain. We don't sell directly, we see the consequences of them slowing down. So what we see is within engineering departments that we sell to, we go through the standard sales cycle of a technical close, commercial close, and then the last bit that's only the small bit is getting the paper signed. And they get to that point, and then basically because uh, within the company, there's either a freeze or the, the authorization levels moved up in terms of getting things signed off. And so they definitely got more restricted budgets than they've had in the last few years, and they find it more difficult. And again, that's why we need to work closely with them because we need to equip the people we speak to to go and speak to whoever's the budget holders to have a compelling case why I need to buy this or they need to buy that. And again, as I said earlier, you know, when it's new capability and, and they can't do it without, then these things are important to try and equip the people we speak to to try and internally for, um, get the, that, that paperwork across the line. So I think Perfect. Tommy, Ashley, thank you very much for that. I think you've addressed all of those questions from investors. And of course, the company will review all the questions submitted today and we'll publish those responses on the Investor Meet company platform. But just before redirecting investors to provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to the company, Tommy, could I just ask you for a few closing comments? Okay. Yeah, it's not the best of times. So I'm not going to try and kid you this. Um, and I've been through this before and there's no pleasure in saying that either um, because it's better when it's all gone up to the right than this. But you know, we believe we can come through this. We have a difficult time we've been through here before. We need to keep managing. We know how to keep our, our current customer base on track or on, on side with us and manage to develop, keep these relationships strong. And then sometimes you can strengthen relationships when you help people through this period. And we do have to kind of wait until the, the world gives us a break, but we're not sitting waiting for the world to give us a break with our new product program that we're going to continue to invest in, looking for new ideas, looking for new opportunities and where we do get opportunities and we get orders and we'll analyze them and go out there looking for where there is money because that's what we need to do. And if we can do that, then, then I believe we can get growth back into the, the business next year. So thank you very much for your time today. Tommy, Ashley, thank you once again for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close the session as you now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Cownex Solutions PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good afternoon to you all.